thanks for the introduction and good afternoon. Then, what is complicated winning? And first, here are my, my conflicts of interest. The question is, what is winning? It's the process that allows us liberating the patient from the ventilator. And it's a step-by-step -step process that starts uh, when the condition of the patient stabilize, stabilize and is going to successful extubation. And as we know, we should start as early as possible. And we can say that weaning is successful only if our patient has not been reintubated. And the time considered for defining weaning failure has changed along the years. And in the most recent uh, definition, it's seven days. It's quite long. And if we look at the winning categories, we have this big series that was uh, done in France some years ago. Uh, more than 2,700 patients were included during the winning phase. And the authors categorized the patient depending on the time that was needed to go from the first attempt of separating the patient from the ventilator to successful weaning. And they found that the majority of our patients, 57%, were easy to win and were weaned during the first day after the first winning attempt. Those patients had low mortality, lower than 6%. And then there was a second group, the patients who were difficult to win. Those patients could be weaned between two and six days after the first winning attempt. Winning attempt was defined as a spontaneous breathing trial or a direct extubation without previous SBT. This second group already had a mortality of more than 16%, much more. And finally, the third group was patients with prolonged weaning who required more than seven days between the first separation attempt and the successful weaning. And those patients have very important mortality, nearly 30%, only after seven days. And we have new data about our ICU patient. And this is the WinSafe study uh, published online some weeks ago. And this is again a big observational study performed in 50 countries, 481 ICUs, and this time with nearly 6,000 patients. Those patients were ventilated during at least two days. And the first important information from this data is that 65% of those patients could be successfully weaned after 90 days. And if we look at when they could be weaned, you can see that the majority of them were also easy to wean patients. The time up to weaning is displayed as pink here. And only patients who really entered in the weaning process are uh, in uh, this graph. That means that only patients who at least had one separation attempt are uh, mentioned here. And if we look at the categories again, you can see that 64.7% were easy to win patients, less than one day for the winning process. 10.1% were in an intermediate group, which was difficult winning in the previous definition between two and six days, and 9.6% were in the prolonged winning group. Those values are very similar to the previous one I've showed you from the other cohort. Then basically, two thirds of our patients are easy to win. Then about winning, the first challenge is to be fast. Why is it important? Because as we already know for a very long time ago, mechanical ventilation duration is associated with decreased in survival. The longer the mechanical ventilation, the lower the survival. And maybe more importantly, if you look at the number of days spent during the weaning process, 
you can see here from the French data that each additional day during the winning process is associated with a clear increase in mortality. Then we have to be fast, but not too fast, because when we fail, and when we have to reintubate our patients, we have a huge increase in mortality. These are old data, and you can see that depending on the, on the studies you read, uh, you have a mortality for the reintubated patient between 27 and 50, compared to mortality between 3 and 12 percent for patients who were not reintubated. And this was again the case in the new WinSafe study. 13.7% of the patients had to be reintubated, and ICU mortality was in the previously described range 29.5%, really high. And interestingly, you can see that those patients who had to be reintubated were mainly in the intermediate winning group and in the prolonged winning group. Then basically, the patients who are easy to win are usually not reintubated, which clinically is quite an important message. And also interestingly, and probably expected, you can see that the majority of patients who were tracheostomized are in the prolonged winning group. Then definitely winning is a matter of balance. Not too late, or as early as possible, but not too early. Then, what is complicated winning? Then, I would say that winning is complicated basically when it is not easy, which means when it takes more than one day. Difficult and prolonged winning. But winning is also complicated when we miss opportunities to get to the next step because this is going to prolong mechanical ventilation. And winning is complicated when we fail, because it's associated with huge increase in mortality. Then, how can we do our best to win our patient? Basically, it depends on when you are in the winning process. Very early, for the patients that are going to be easy to win, the real challenge is to detect early that the patient can be weaned. We know that for a very long time ago. Those data published by Ellie and collaborators in 1996 show very well that compared to standard of care, if you have a protocolized approach that was an association of daily screening of the ability to breast spontaneously and of the presence of readability to wean criteria and a systematic stop in sedation, this allowed to reduce the duration of mechanical ventilation, very well known. But are we good doing that every day? Based on the data of the WinSafe study, I think we can say no. You have here the distribution of the patient who entered the winning process. In yellow, do you have the time of the first star signs of spontaneous breathing. In red, you have the time when the patients had the winning eligibility criteria based on FIO2 and PEEP essentially. In blue, you have the first separation attempt. And then in green, you have the winning success. And you can see that there is a gap between the time point where people have the winning eligibility criteria and the time when the first separation attempt was really done. And basically, if we look at those data a bit more in detail, the median time from winning eligibility to the first separation attempt was one day. Not bad. But what is not good at all is that 22.4% of patients had a delay of more than five days between winning eligibility to first separation attempt and five additional days on the mechanical ventilator is associated with a huge increase in mortality. And the presence of this time interval between the development of the winning eligibility criteria and the first separation attempt was associated with winning failure 
and prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation, then definitely we can do better. And in this study, the authors have looked at the factors that are associated with this delay in going on with the winning process. And you can see that we have the frailty before ICU admission. You have admission for trauma reason. You have a high SOFA score. You have the use of continuous muscular blockers. And you have the use of sedation at time of the presence of the winning eligibility criteria. Then basically, based on that, I think we can say that we are very conservative with our approach when we try to wing our patient, probably too conservative. Then, if we go back to the group of winning or to the type of uh, winning classification, for early winning, we just have to be faster. What about difficult winning? Those patients who need between two and six days to be separated from the ventilator. For those patients, the challenge is to understand why there is a delay of winning when we really try to win them. And we have to try to find all the reversible causes for delayed winning and treat those causes. And if we look at the literature, we know what we have to look for. First, we have to fight against heavy sedation and to the absence of stopping sedation, because those two things are related with prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation. We should avoid overassist, because overassist is associated with asynchronies, and asynchronies is associated with prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation. And maybe even more importantly, overassist is a risk factor for difficulties in detecting that your patient can be weaned from the ventilator. Then we should try to avoid positive fluid balance, also associated with prolonged duration of mechanical ventilation and a failure of the spontaneous breathing trial. And we should try to help with medication to the reason that increased respiratory load and especially treat cardiovascular dysfunction, try to treat underlying lung disease as best as possible, and also look for the reason for reduced respiratory capacity, especially muscle weakness, even if it's much more difficult to fight against that. And now, what about the patient with prolonged winning, the one who have high mortality? Here, the challenge is that we need to be very efficient as a team because those patients are challenging for everyone. Because a patient with prolonged weaning has been severely ill, is in your unit for quite a long time, was sometimes already frail before admission, has comorbidities, has ICU-acquired weakness, and need the physiotherapists, often has fluid overload, is at risk for denutrition, and you usually has denutrition, is often confused, anxious, needs analgesia, sedation, can have endocrine dysfunction, then definitely those patients can be efficiently managed only by all the team and a good interaction between the different members. Then, as take-home messages, I would say that complicated weaning is when weaning lasts more than one day. And this concerns nearly 20% of our patients who enter in the weaning phase. A lot of patients. I would say that weaning is complicated when we miss opportunities to liberate our patients from the ventilator. And this is very often. Winning is complicated when winning fails, 
important because it's quite a lot of patients and this is associated with high mortality and it's important to try to prevent extubation failure using, for example, NIV or high flow. And complicated weaning is associated with poor outcome, but we know what are the challenges depending on the group of the patients regarding the weaning phase. And we have a potential for improvement. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thank you very much. It was a great overview, and uh, you finished exactly at the point of 15 minutes, which is great. So the talk is open for uh, discussion. Any questions from the audience? If, if there is no questions, just a very brief question to you. Um, always when, when I intubate a patient, I immediately start to think about the weaning. And, uh, and then, if the patient fails and uh, needs uh, prolonged ventilation, we always ask without the timing of the extubation. And my question to you is, is there any studies or what is your experience on the rate of reintubation in the unit? The reason I'm asking is that the units who uh, actually extubate too early and have a higher intubation rate probably should prolong a little bit. On the other side, if you have a zero rate of reintubation, you probably ventilate too long. So could you comment on this? I think it's a kind of quality criteria. And definitely, if we have a very low uh, reintubation rate, we should be faster, especially in the very early phase. And maybe we could even consider not being very strict with the spontaneous breathing trial we use for patients who are intubated during a very short period of time. At least it's a question. And if we have a lot of reintubation, then Definitely, we must be more careful. Then Something's use wrong. that as a quality index. Right. Something's wrong. Yeah, yeah please. Very good and difficult question. It depends a lot on the patient prognosis, I think, because we should tracheostomize ideally only patients who have a chance to recover. This is the first part of the answer. And then uh, I don't uh, use tracheostomy for all the reintubated patients. If after analysis, I think that there is a potentially uh, imp improvable factor, something I can do to avoid a new a failure, then I won't intubate this patient. If oppositely, everything was checked before, all what is reversible has been excluded, and this patient, even with extubation criteria, failed, probably we should intubate, we should uh, tracheostomize quite early. It depends on the reason. Thanks again, Liz, for this excellent talk. So now we move to Alexandre Moule for the assessment of muscle strength. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation. Good afternoon to everyone. So uh, I'm going to try to uh, give you a few tips on how to assess respiratory muscle strength in ICU patients. Here are my disclosures, mostly in the field of mechanical ventilation, as you can see. So, um, the, uh, the success of winning is based on the good adequation between those three guys. Uh, we, the, the patient needs a good drive, uh, strength, strong respiratory muscles, and a reasonable mechanical loading. So those two guys have to work all together. And if they work together, if there is not too much imbalance between them, then there's good chance that winning is successful. If, for instance, there is 
um, increased mechanical loading, for, for instance, uh, because of altered respiratory mechanics, let's say uh, high uh, resistance because uh, asthma, um, then winning could fail because even with an increased drive and strong muscles, those muscles could not be able to compensate the increased mechanical loading. But if we have weak muscles, actually, for instance, because the patient has been mechanically ventilated for seven days, 10 days, there might be ICU-acquired diaphragm weakness. And then, even with a reasonable mechanical loading, there might be winning failure. And this is in this case that we would like to uh, assess the function and the strengths of respiratory muscles. So first, what does not assess respiratory muscle strength? This is an important issue, so many things are not assessing respiratory muscle strength, obviously, but many people ask me about EMG and PO1. So although those uh, two signals can give you information regarding respiratory muscle strengths. These have been mostly designed to measure drive. I said mostly designed to, so it's possible to use them to assess in some respect respiratory muscle strengths, but they have not been primarily designed for this. So I, I won't deal with those uh, markers. So the first way you could assess uh, respiratory muscle strength basically is with clinical examination. So put your hand on the abdomen of your patient in a patient with a normal diaphragm with no dysfunction. During inspiration, the diaphragm goes downwards and in response to this downward, uh, downward motion of the uh, diaphragm, there is an expansion of the abdomen. There is an inflation of the abdomen. In case of diaphragm dysfunction, we get a paradoxical motion of the abdomen. The diaphragm doesn't move or even goes upwards. And then we are going to have a deflation of the abdominal wall, so uh, your hand will be down. So this is a very easy way to diagnose a severe diaphragm dysfunction. Obviously, if it's not very severe, you're not going to make the diagnosis clinically. The wrong way would be to assume that there is a very good correlation between lip muscle strength and diaphragm strength. Unfortunately, there is not good correlation here. Uh, there's the patient of a study by Martin Dress, and on the y-axis we have the AMRC score, and on the x-axis uh, the diaphragm strength assessed by um, phrenic nerve stimulation. And you can see that uh, some patients here have very severe diaphragm dysfunction, but normal limb muscle strength. So limb muscle strength, although very easy to assess, is not a good marker of diaphragm dysfunction. But you, we have tools that we can use. And first, we have pressure. And second, we have ultrasound. So let's start with pressure. So if my patient is, uh, is still sedated and not triggering the ventilator, if there is no spontaneous activity of respiratory muscles, unfortunately, you have, there's only one technique you can use and I would say that less than 1% of you have this technique. We use it mostly for research and to uh, expertise, very difficult to win patients. I'm just showing you this, but it's very difficult to bring it back in your units. The rest of my talk, you can bring it back in your units. So phrenic nerve stimulation consists in stimulating the two phrenic nerves, which will induce a contraction of the diaphragm. In response to this contraction, we measure the pressure at the opening of the endotracheal tube. And this is the, the, the swing in pressure at the distal extremity of the endotracheal tube we measure. And for instance, this is strength get from a patient without diaphragm dysfunction. And this is 
reduced in a patient with diaphragm dysfunction, we consider the normal value as 11 centimeters of water. This is the only technique you can use if the patient has no spontaneous activity of respiratory muscles. Now we'll move on to techniques that you could use in your units. So if your patient is under pressure, ventilation, pressure support ventilation, but um, not fully cooperative, there is one measure you can easily use, which is occlusion pressure. So it consists in occluding the ventilator and measuring the swing in pressure that you could easily measure on the ventilator screen. This is the occlusion pressure, not the PO1, the occlusion pressure, because some people make confusion between PO1 and occlusion pressure. And it's accepted that predicted uh, muscle pressure is minus three, qu three quarter of occlusion pressure. A recent very nice study from Liu Hunk's group has validated this measure and they show that there is a very nice correlation between occlusion pressure and transdiaphragmatic pressure, which is a gold standard. And especially for a kind of normal value, it's not as good for extreme value, but you can see that occlusion pressure is very good to detect a very low transdiaphragmatic pressure. So it's very good to detect a severe diaphragm dysfunction. So I think that this tool can be easily used by you on a daily basis in your units. It's not very time consuming. And then if your patient is fully cooperative, you can use maximum inspiratory pressure. So it needs to be a little bit trained and your patient has to be fully cooperative because you're going to ask your patient to make a strong inspiratory effort while airway are occluded and you're going to measure the pressure that is generated by your patient during this very strong uh, volitional effort. And this effort has to be at least one and a half second and you're going to measure the mean value over the first second. So you understand right now that in an ICU patient, this is very frequently difficult to perform. But Truitt and Marini, John Marini, uh, a long time ago, understanding that in many ICU patients, this static effort is almost impossible, used um, a one-way valve that permits only exhalation. So this valve is connected to the androtracheal tube and then the patient can exhale but cannot inhale. So the result is that at every breathe the patient is emptying the lung and the inspiratory effort is increasing and they shown in this very elegant paper that this technique could, uh, this te technique, sorry, permitted to get better values. And it's very easy to use this at bedside. However, I'm very cautious with maximal, uh, maximum inspiratory pressure. To me, high values, I would say, so normal values are around 80 for you, for instance. Uh, I would say that more than 40, 60 in an ICU patient is great. High values exclude respiratory muscle weakness. But if you get low values, it's always embarrassing because you never know whether those low values may reflect the poor technique or the poor effort of the patient or if they reflect really respiratory muscle weakness. However, note that this technique is quite easy to perform. Then we have diaphragm ultrasound. So diaphragm ultrasound to measure uh, diaphragm strength should be used only when patient trigger the ventilator. You cannot use diaphragm ultrasound to assess diaphragm strength if the patient is fully relaxed. Doesn't work because 
uh, to evaluate diaphragm strength with ultrasound, you need that there's diaphragm contractions, basically. So, what do we have to perform uh, diaphragm ultrasound? So, the best way to evaluate diaphragm strength, to be honest, is the transthoracic or intercostal view. We use the linear probe and we found the zone of apposition of the diaphragm. So you see here, the diaphragm is here. I'm gonna show you another picture that is just after this one. So we have the liver here, the diaphragm here. Here there's a little plural effusion. So uh, we put the probe at eighth or ninth intercostal space on the mid axillary line. And we, we, can, we can do e either two two dimension mode uh, and M mode or stick to two dimension mode works very well also. So so you see here you have the, the liver the liver is here and the diaphragm is here between those two white lines. It's very easy to recognize the diaphragm because there is this white signals here, which is the floating layer, we call it like this. And you see that every time the diaphragm contracts, then the diaphragm thickens. It's like every muscle. So when a muscle contracts, the muscle thickens. So it's the same for the diaphragm. So what you're gonna measure is the end expiratory in yellow, thickness of the diaphragm, and the end inspiratory thickness of the diaphragm in red. And then you're going to calculate the thickening fraction of the diaphragm, which means to what extent the diaphragm thickens at each inspiration. And data from our group and, and others uh, show that uh, diaphragm thickening fraction of less than 30% is associated with winning failure. So it's a very simple tool that you can use at bedside in your unit. And we have validated this technique against the gold standard, which is phrenic nerve stimulation. And we see that we have a very good correlation between the diaphragm thickening fraction and, and the phrenic nerve strength, uh, sorry, the diaphragm strength evaluated with phrenic nerve stimulation. And you see it here with the dashed line, uh, the, the rock curve of the diaphragm uh, thickening fractions, very good to predict diaphragm dysfunction. So it's a quite a good tool, I would say. So then in what patient should we assess um, respiratory muscle strength? To be honest, we are not gonna do this in every patient. I mean, every time we win a patient, we don't have time for this. I mean, we have many patients we should manage. So uh, we have to select patient. I, I think to me, that it's, it's, a, it's a tool, it's a, this assessment should be performed every time a patient fail winning. And this is a subset of patients, but when a patient fail winning, um, I think that, that once we have excluded that, for instance, um, uh, resistance, respiratory resistance uh, are not too high and, and ARDS is healed, and there is no winning induced pulmonary edema, then we should assess respiratory muscle strength. And this is a pretty much high amount of patients. Those are data from uh, the WinSafe study uh, that Liz Piki, you presented just before. And I asked Tai Pham, the first author, how many patients failed the uh, spontaneous breathing trial. And, and on the nearly 3,000 patients who had at least one spontaneous breathing trial, you see that winning failure was 25%. And as Professor Piquilieu pointed, among the patients, the 3,654 patients who had at least one extubation, 14% of them were reintubated. So in these patients, I think that they're good candidates for uh, such assessments. So my take home message is that respiratory muscle strength should be assessed in case of winning failure. If the patient is fully cooperative, you can try maximum inspiratory pressure, 
be careful when it's low value. It can be poor measurement, poor cooperation. And as soon as the patient is under pressure support ventilation, you can use either ultrasound or uh, PHOC. They are quite accurate to predict diaphragm dysfunction. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you for your nice talk. It's open for discussion. Just a brief question. Uh, when you ask the muscle strength, uh, probably there is a difference in the muscle strength in patients in the morning versus in the evening uh, during the day when they get tired from you know the regular activities. Do you have any suggestion when to perform this? or whether uh, the, the outcome prediction based on measurement differs uh, during the day if you, if you measure, or whether it's a right question? That, that's an excellent question. It has, I don't think it has been evaluated. Uh, I don't think there are studies like, like diaphragm strength in the morning, diaphragm strength in the afternoon, comparison between uh, those two measurements. Uh, what we, we do is, in general, in the morning. Uh, we do in the morning. Um, no, we do both actually. <laughs> no, we do both actually because sometimes we do SBT in the morning uh, and we wait a little bit and in the afternoon we do diaphragm ultrasound. You know, the patient fails SBT in the morning and we decide uh, at lunch, you know, say, okay, lunch time, uh, okay, we need to evaluate this diaphragm and we do it in the afternoon. So, no, I cannot give you a clear recommendation regarding what time of the day we should do this assessment. I understand. I'm just referring my. I, I'm more experienced with the weaning of uh, in cardiac failure patients, mm. and it's completely different if you if you assess in the morning when they are relaxed and uh, you know after uh, uh, after uh, quiet place in, in during the night versus in the afternoon after all the activities. So, okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? Oh, there's. Yeah, please. Hello, Karen Schoenert from Belgium. I've got short practical question. If you measure thickening fraction do you, in pressure support mode, do you set the pressure support on zero, eight, or what? It's, it's a great question. Um, we, we need more standardization. The problem is like the cutoff values I gave you uh, are from studies in which patients were at the pressure support level of 10 plus or minus 2. Personally, what I suggest today is to uh, measure under zero pressure support and, and zip. And, and we need to standardize this value with zero, zero. And, and now we do it with zero, zero. In some units, they just disconnect the patient from the ventilator the time they do this. But, you know, it's okay. So we do now, we do zero, zero. There were some other questions. My question is the same. I'm Luigi Vetrugno from Italy. Uh, uh, do you think that we can try to put the patient's T-tube and uh, try also excursion? So, uh, first, um, so you can do T-tube, uh, and, and it's, a, you know, between T-tube and zero, zero, the, um, the, the diaphragm uh, work is not very different. It's a little bit higher with zero, zero, but it's very close. So t I would say that T-tube or zero, zero is pretty the same. You can do both. Uh, excursion, so I did not mention the excursion, first because you know the time, yes. And also because the correlation between excursion and diaphragm strength is not as good as a diaphragm <coughs> fraction. It's not as good. It's not bad, but not as good. But to be honest, we do both. We do excursion and thickening fraction. For this talk, I prefer just to talk about uh, the most reliable value. Mark from Barcelona. So you use the cutoff value of 30% with a pressure support of 10 with the zero, zero would be the same kind of value. So it might be a little bit different. It might be a little bit higher because the lower the pressure support level and then the higher the thickening fraction of the diaphragm. But I think that, that there's 
there's some groups working on, on what's the new cutoff value with 0, 0. But probably, you know, 35 is probably the, 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 the cutoff value. But in general, it's not, you know, I don't like like this story of 30 because we, we found 30, other group found 30, everyone found 30 actually. But, you know, it's, uh, it's, we are measuring a very small muscle. muscle. So, so I would say that to me, the difference is between like 40 and 10. So if the patient has 10, there's a big issue. If your patient has 20, 25, 35, you know, it's very difficult to make the difference. So is, it, is there diaphragm weakness or not? It's difficult. I mean, if it's 10, 15, 20, okay, there's this function. Thank you very much. Alexandre. So now it's time to move to Audrey de Jong to explain when, where, and how to extubate. Thank you uh, very much. Hello, um, everybody, dear colleagues, dear moderator. Thank you a lot to the scientific committee for the invitation. Here are my link of uh, interest. And we start with the WinSafe uh, study, who, which was already detailed by Professor uh, Pikiu. And as she said, there are a lot of patients uh, who failed the first separation attempt, as only 74% of patients uh, had the successful separation attempt, and only 65% of patients with invasive mechanical ventilation ha has winning success. Overall, when uh, you perform an attempt of extubation in critically ill patients, about 10%, it depends, between 5% and 20% according to the studies, will experience extubation failure. So what we try to do in a, in a multicenter study performed in France uh, was to separate risk factors from airway failure and from non-airway failure or winning failure. So when we analyzed the incidence of airway failure versus non-airway failure, we found that 5% of extubation had an airway failure and 5% of extubation had a winning failure, so an inability to be separated from the ventilator. The airway failure being more related to the airway itself. And uh, then in the second part of the study, we separated risk factor for airway and non-airway or winning failure. What we found was that copious secretion were a risk factor for airway failure before extubation, as length of intubation of more than eight days, so prolonged length of intubation. Female sex also, maybe because of the, the size of the tube. And then we have specific risk factor for non-airway failure. We had the severity of the patient. We found a threshold of so far of eight. We had the body mass index and surprisingly, the low body mass index had more winning failure. And we had factors common to both airway and winning failure. So we had uh, absence of strong cough. As you know, cough is the, st one of the strongest predictor of extubation success. And the fact of being intubated for acute respiratory failure or for coma. Of course, there are also specific risk factors for the neurological patient, and I think Professor Roba will talk about it in the, in the next talk. So when performing extubation? During the night, during the, the day, uh, we, we all had calls and uh, we say at midnight, uh, what should we do? Should we extubate this patient or not extubate this patient? So it was uh, studied a lot by uh, Professor Gershengon, and uh, it was found that one-fifth of patients with mechanical ventilation in the United States ICU undergo overnight extubation, 
And this overnight extubation was associated in this study with higher rates of ICU and hospital mortality. On the other side, the same uh, authors assess following cardiac surgery, overnight extubation, and they found uh, more or less the contrary. Overnight extubation was associated with little risk and uh, was associated with a reduction of ICU length of stays for those requiring mechanical ventilation of more than eight hours. So maybe surgical are different from medical patient and maybe uh, the complicated medical patient, it's, uh, we can wait for daytime for extubation, but the, but the surgical patient, whether cardiac or, or abdominal, if it is time to extubate, maybe during the night, it would be, uh, it would be okay. Now, for example, this patient, uh, he had abdominal surgery, it's 10 p.m., and uh, the duration of surgery was of 10 hours. When starting, winning of mechanical ventilation for extubation at 10 p.m. or tomorrow morning. So we performed a, a study by Professor Shank and Professor Jaber, and uh, they performed immediate interruption of sedation after surgery of critically ill patients. And they found that when uh, you interrupt the sedation immediately, it was associated with improved out outcomes and decreased length of mechanical ventilation and length of stay. So the surgical patient may be extubation as soon as possible. And overall, all the patients should be weaned as soon as possible, as said uh, Professor Piquiu. So now we're performing extubation for a surgical patient, because in ICU, extubation will be performed in ICU. But the title was when, where, and how, so where. <laughs> so for surgical patient, uh, we had more or less the choice between ICU and operating room for performing extubation. And uh, a recent uh, review was uh, published this year. It was again in cardiac surgical uh, patients. And uh, it was found um, that uh, there risk factors for delayed extubation exist as pre-existing cardiac insufficiency or renal disease, time on pump and cross clamp time. But overall, there is no clear criteria for patient selection. For this patient, should I extubate in ICU or operating room? It is unclear, and we also have no clear data about outcome, even if the literature is abundant on the, on the subject. So what's new? How to increase the rate of success of extubation? And that we all only present recent data about uh, the, the mean to increase this rate of success. First, after uh, starting winning, of course, I had um, the consent of the patient for the picture. After starting winning, uh, which spontaneous breathing trial? It was a patient with pancreatitis and he spent uh, almost one year in, uh, in our ICU. So which spontaneous breathing trial? In 2019, uh, among patients receiving mechanical ventilation, the authors compare a spontaneous breathing trial of 30 minutes of pressure support ventilation and a spontaneous breathing trial of two hours of T-piece ventilation. And they find that when using pressure support ventilation, it led to significantly, significantly higher rates of successful extubation. However, one can say that two hours of TPs is a little bit uh, long for every patient, at least. Then we had uh, last year the study by Arnaud Till and colleagues published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And they assess patients at high risk, high risk of extubation failure, def defined as more than 65 years or underlying chronic cardiac or respiratory disease. They found that performing spontaneous breathing trial with pressure support ventilation or with TPs did not result in significant difference in ventilatory three days at day 28 or difference at for reintubation. Though maybe for this iris patient, you can choose according to lo your local practice to perform pressure support ventilation or TPs or individualize the management.
One important point uh, was the very nice study for, from Dr. Fernandez and Fernandez uh, about the reconnection of mechanical ventilation for one hour after a successful spontaneous birthing trial. And they found that this reconnection, reconnection reduced reintubation in critically ill patients. So it is our practice now for each patient after a spontaneous breathing trial, we reconnect the patient between 30 minutes and one hour and then extu perform extubation. And uh, this data were uh, confirmed in a recent study published in, in CHESS in 2021. In overall patient, there was no significant difference between the patient reconnected to mechanical ventilation and over patient. But subgroup exploratory findings suggested that this strategy may benefit in patients with prolonged ventilation of more than three days. Again, the surgical patient ventilating in the operating room is not, it's not the same than the medical patient with prolonged ventilation. In, in the specific uh, population of patients with obesity, uh, our team, the team of Professor Jabert, assess the best spontaneous breathing trial to assess the work of breathing that the patient will have after extubation. So in the y-axis, you have the work of breathing, and in the x-axis, you have the different type of spontaneous breathing trial. So it was found that expiratory effort measured during winning test with either a TPS or a PSV0 and the PIP0 was similar to post-extubation inspiratory effort in patients with obesity. On the contrary, the winning test with positive pressure overestimated post-extubation inspiratory effort. So maybe in patients with obesity, again, a medical patient, some often difficult to win, uh, you can perform a spontaneous breathing trial with TPS or PSV0 of PIP, or PIP0. Of course, it was a, it was a physiological study without uh, assessment of outcomes, so these results need to be confirmed. Which method now of oxygen delivery during spontaneous breathing trial? It was assessed in two recent studies, and what they found that TPS SBT and was was um, was uh, um, less good to, uh, for, uh, regarding the percentage of reintubation that spontaneous breathing trial with high flow oxygen. Of course, high flow oxygen allow good humidification and it can be, um, and, and it can be done during spontaneous breathing trial. And those results were confirmed by a recent paper in critical care uh, without significant difference in the overall population, but uh, with uh, increased benefit in patient intubated for respiratory reasons. What about diaphragm stimulation? Professor Demoul talked a lot about diaphragm and his team performed a study about diaphragm stimulation through a sub subclavier catheter and they found that the temporary transvenous diaphragm neurostimulation was associated with a significant increase in maximal inspiratory pressure so uh, for now, it's not available in routine, but maybe in the, in the future, we will have this, this therapeutic. Should we wait for hemodynamic stability before extubating our patients? A very nice study published uh, last year in the Blue Journal assessed the extubation with vasopressor and separated low dose vasopressor from high dose vasopressor. And that found that Extubation with low dose vasopressor was feasible without additional risk, but high dose vasopressor was associated with more reintubation by, um, by four days. What about ultrasounds? Ultrasounds are very useful and there are many, many recent pub publications. I cannot um, detail all, but uh, what we can um, remember is that cardiac ultrasound uh, should be almost systematically performed during SBT or at least assessment of cardiac function, for example, with um, brain BNP, and also lung ultrasound. And the best is to combine 
all, uh, all the techniques that we know, cardiac, lung, and diaphragm assessment during SBT to optimize the prediction, as you, as you see here in this study, of um, failure of extubation. So how to extubate in practice? Better in semi-sitting position, better to reventilate after suction to avoid the derecrutment, and then we can remove the tracheal tube while inspiration and of course after deflating the balloon. <laughs> and uh, to finish, how to prevent reintubation after extubation? There are also many studies on the field. The, the, one of the last was the study again published by the team of Arnaud Thiel. And then compare in a high risk patient, high flow alone versus high flow combined to non invasive ventilation, and found that adding non invasive ventilation performed better and reduced the rate of reintubation in these high risk critical ill patients. Uh, our team, the team of Professor Jaber, published this year the effect of non invasive ventilation after extubation in patients with obesity. And what we found is that for all subgroup of patients, in IV decreased the risk for treatment failure compared to oxygen therapy, whether standard or high flow nasal oxygen. And it also decreased the rate of reintubation uh, when we assess the crossover uh, from the oxygen standard group to non-invasive ventilation performed as a rescue strategy. To conclude, we can prevent airway failure, and here is a picture um, uh, summarizing uh, all, all that we said. We can also prevent winning failure, and uh, remember to have a negative fluid balance and to assess hemodynamic before extubation, not only uh, the lung. And we can also prevent both winning and airway failure from diaphragmatic function and from combined use of in, in IV and nasal oxygen. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very nice and comprehensive. Any questions from uh, the audience? Yes, please. Please take a microphone. microphone. I can repeat, maybe. Uh, you prefer to exacerbate the patient during the inspiration? Why is that? Yes. Why? Why inspiration? Why inspi inspiration? But to, to open the lung uh, at the maximum. I think there are several old studies that found that it was associated with uh, less atelectasis. No, it's not your practice? <laughs> that's, uh, that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, I always extubate during exhalation and coughing, but okay. maybe that's a new way. Okay. okay. Good to know. Any other questions? Yes, please. In the back. I was wondering what's your experience in extubating patients with cardiac dysfunction with their TPs? Because since there is an increase of LB afterload uh, without a positive pressure, yeah. uh, it could be like a, a test, a better test in terms of uh, predicting the extubation failure. Because in the paper that you mentioned, there is one of the inclusion criteria was chronic or acute heart failure. Mm. But we don't really know whether there was a, an actual LB dysfunction or not. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think it's the problem of a big randomized controlled trial eh, without individualization of therapy. But you're, you're right, eh, using TPs, uh, uh, you remove positive pressure, so it is the worst condition. Uh, for the patient. So if the patient is okay with the TPs, you can think that it will be okay after. But I think uh, it, it will be also um, uh, an, another talk, uh, the, the talk of Professor Perkins. We talk about winning of difficult patient and also with cardiac patients in, the, in this session. Last question, please. Is failure of extubation, is there a consensus definition? Because if you're in intensive care for 10 days, you get extubated on day two and then 
you're in you're in you're in intensive care and you're still on neuroadrenaline, whatever, and then day seventy you're reintubated for a different reason, or you, is that how do you how do we define failed extubate failed extubation? Do you, you know what I mean? Is it I always find that if it was reported, um, is there a universal in, in the people who work in this area? Is there a universal sort of is yeah. it no matter what if you get reintubated that same emission that is automatically a failure versus what happened if you had to get reintubated for to go down to have a CT scan or something? You, okay. you know what I mean? So it's the question about experience in the no. Or, or just how is how is fail, you know failed extubation rate if you're reporting your failure rates internationally? Yeah. Does everybody use the same criteria to say this is a failed extubation? Mm. Uh, I think now that there is different criteria across uh, across countries, absolutely. But the WinSafe study uh, assessed a lot of, of countries, so yeah. summarize uh, what, what is done. And they all had the same criteria to say it was a failure. And in operating room? Or in the ICU. In, sorry, I didn't understand. So the, the, the maybe to, to <laughs> there's no definite uh, yeah. definition, but the consensus is moving towards seven days uh, to define failed extubation because of the use of non-invasive support uh, during the two or three days. Thank you. <laughs> thank okay. you. Thank you very much, Audrey. And we'll, we'll move further. Uh, I kindly ask Heli Gershenhorn from Miami uh, to give a talk on uh, non-traditional risk factors for failed extubation. Great, thank you all very much. Um, this is not uh, was not intended, but I think what I will now seek to do is sort of a deep dive into a couple of the areas that Dr. Dijong went through. Um, and I'll try to explain sort of where some of the, I think, uh, good information and then some limitations might come so that we can understand how to think about them in the context of these studies. So um, again, I'll be talking a little bit about non-traditional risk factors for failed extubation. Um, these are my disclosures. None of them are particularly relevant for this. So just to put us all on the same page, when I'm talking about non-traditional, this is really a diagnosis of exclusion. What I mean by that is I want to show you, and I think many of these have been covered in prior talks, what we mean by traditional risk factors. And then I'm sort of talking about here anything that I think we are not trained to think of, and many of them actually Dr. Zhang just went through, about other things that might impact the extubation success of our, our patients. So in terms of traditional risk factors, there was a really nice meta-analysis just done um, in the last year or so where they included 66 studies that had looked at possible risk factors for extubation. And ultimately, they narrowed it down from 49 to this cadre of, I believe, about 20, where these were risk factors found in more than one study that were univariably associated with failed extubation. And I think to the question that you were just asking, I don't think there's, and, and as you were, as you were uh, hearing, there's not a cons there hasn't been a consistent definition. Most of the studies that I am familiar with, and certainly the work that I'll talk about that we've done, talks about reintubation within 48 hours. Now that predates the much larger use of non-invasive and high flow. And the reason for that is that, at least in the US, when we looked at large data sets, about greater than 95% of people who ultimately get reintubated on an ICU admission are reintubated within 48 hours. So that was sort of we came, where we came up with that, but there's certainly um, not a consistent, there hasn't been consistent agreement. And as you can see here, they sort of these authors broke this down into three different categories that I think sort of ring true to all of us, right? Underlying comorbidities, acute disease processes, and then characteristics related presumably to the physiologic state of the patient at the time of extubation. They've color-coded them here. There are some red ones that pertain to the cardiovascular system. There is an orange one that pertains to the neurologic system. And then the vast majority of them, I think, again, not surprising to us, right, are respiratory uh, system parameters. And then there's some, some um, additional ones. Um, and so when I think about this, this to me is sort of the chronic state of my patient and then the acute state of my patient, both what landed them in the ICU and how they're doing and what landed them on the ventilator and how they're doing, right? And so t I've sort of categorized them this way. On the left-hand side are those that came out of that meta-analysis, right? Things about my patient and their sort of chronic and acute state of illness. But then on the right-hand side, and as Dr. Dijon was mentioning, there are really a myriad of other things that I think go into a lot of our thinking. If you just think about the person that you're about to extubate and their family is at the bedside, you may be much more enthusiastic than you might be if their family is absent, if they're a patient who's delirious, right? So there are other things I think that kind of go into our decision-making that haven't traditionally been studied. 
And I've categorized these here just because it makes it neat for me to explain a couple of our studies. The external environment, non-respiratory system, and what I mean by that is acute abnormalities, and then other factors. And I just want to go through some examples. So this is really going to be a bit of a deep dive into a couple of the studies that you guys were um, uh, brought that were brought to your attention in the last talk. And we've done a bit of work looking, as was described, at the sort of importance of the timing of day of extubation. And what had us thinking about that was a number of things. But first, we thought about different personnel, right? The people who would make the decision to extubate might be different at night versus the daytime. The people who might be around to rescue the patient if the patient doesn't do well might be different during the daytime versus the nighttime. And then finally, as I mentioned, family presence, which for many of our patients actually is a particularly calming influence, right? May or may not be, depending on where you work, different different times of the day. There's also the possibility that circadian biology plays into um, how we uh, people may or may not succeed with a stress like extubation. And then finally, there may be some other factors that I've sort of not conceptualized and maybe you guys can, can throw out to me um, that might drive this. So this led us whoop, to investigate first in this study that was alluded to by Dr. Zhang, um, a large mixed med surge, largely med surge ICU population across the US. This is from a data set in the early 2000s, from 2000 to 2009. It includes close to 100,000 um, mechanically ventilated patients. Um, and as was alluded to, about a fifth of them are extubated overnight, which we defined as 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. And that is similarly not consistently defined in the literature, but but largely agreed upon. And we said, all right, there are going to be some differences between the patients who are extubated during the day and overnight. We chose a propensity matching approach. The value of that, just so we're all thinking about the literature, I think in as rich a way we can, is that it allows us to sort of match patients who are extubated overnight to counterparts during the day that might look most similar to them. But what it doesn't allow us to do is look at all patients who were extubated overnight versus all patients that were extubated during the day, right? So it really does limit, it makes a more homogeneous type of population. But just keep in mind, even when we're thinking about what our real world practice is, this is not everybody we extubate. Nonetheless, we created these matched pairs and we compared their outcomes. We separated our cohort into patients who had longer, greater than 12 hours of mechanical ventilation versus shorter, less than 12 hours. This is the greater than 12 hours group. You can see we about about 5,700 pairs. And then I have sort of plotted here the reintubation rate, which was in this case ever reintubated during the ICU stay. Um, and as I said, about you know 95% of those are within 48 hours whether they died by ICU discharge and whether they died by hospital discharge. And unfortunately, this data set does not go beyond that. And as you can see, what's here on the uh, plotted on each of the, of the forest plots is the adjusted odds ratio after adjusting for this propensity score. And you can see that there's an increased risk of reintubation, ICU mortality, and hospital mortality associated with being extubated overnight. Again, this is a mixed med surge population. And I will call your attention, we're thinking about limitations of it. We did our best to adjust for the fact that some patients may be palliatively extubated or care may have been withdrawn um, with a goal of palliation at different times. And we tried to adjust for that. But remember, if I think about my own ICU practice, sometimes I'm waiting around until the family comes in after work to do that, right? And so that may or may not be differentially uh, represented in nights and days. So that's just another piece of uh, a caveat to this. But then we looked, I think as was alluded to, well, who are the people who seem to drive this association? And so we looked across three different sort of types of patients. The first was, were you admitted for a medical or a surgical reason? And this particular data set allows us to qualify uh, surgery by elective versus uh, emergent. Then what type of ICU are you in? As you guys may know, in the US in particular, especially amongst our academic ICUs, we frequently will have ICUs targeting a certain population, so medical or surgical or mixed med surge. And then I think one of the questions that came up, especially when thinking about, is it the personnel who's around to make the decision and potentially to reintubate, were there the presence of overnight intensivists, We're, which might make you think that the day and the night are more similar to one another. And as you can see, it was really the medical medical patients in medical ICUs in the absence of an overnight intensivist that really seemed to drive this signal. Um, we did say, and I'll just put it here, that we saw no difference for short uh, mechanical ventilation duration patients, which really is uh, similar to Dr. Zhang was saying, these are a different cohort of folks. Um, and then the flip side of this is because that cohort intentionally did not include cardiac surgery patients, we wanted to look specifically at those. And the reason that we took them out is specifically within the US, there, there are targets, and there may be around the world I'm not familiar with, I apologize, targets for when you need to try to extubate your patients after they come back from the operating room as a quality benchmark. And so there's a lot of pressure for our cardiac intensivists to extubate within six and certainly within 24 hours. 
we also knew that patients who arrived in the ICU at different times of day were going to be different, right? The first case, the third case might be different. And so we, we stratified by that. But as you can see, anybody who required mechanical ventilation for more than eight hours had a higher risk, I mean, sorry, uh, no difference in risk of reintubation and a higher chance of leaving the ICU sooner. So it seemed like in this population, this was a safer thing to do. Um, I, I want to call your attention to a systematic review and meta-analysis that was just published on this topic because I think that it will be where everybody turns and similar to calling out the limitations in our data, I'd like to call out the limitations in this. They found six studies to include, again, two of them are ours, and as you can see, all comers, they determined there was no difference in reintubation rate. But in one of their supplementary figures, they did, I think, what all of us who've been studying this set out to do in advance, which is separate cardiac surgery from non-cardiac surgery patients for the reasons I mentioned about coming out of the operating room and also because their severity of illness often looks quite high when they arrive in the ICU, as those of you uh, who take care of them know, but they do remarkably well, right? So they're just sort of a different cohort. They similarly in this meta-analysis found no difference on the left-hand side for cardiac surgery patients in terms of reintubation, but they claim to find also no difference in, in uh, reintubation for, for the non-cardiac surgery population. But I think this signal is driven largely by that fourth study, which second to ours is the second largest, and really includes more than 50% of their patients are cardiac surgery. So I don't, I'm afraid that this you know, meta-analysis on its own looks like it's probably safe for all comers, but I just want you kind of to know the, the caveats there. Okay, and then similarly, I'll dive a little bit deep into the study that uh, Dr. Zhang mentioned with regard to extubating people on shock because in shock, because again, I think that this has some caveats that we should pay attention to. We can imagine that people may do less well, and many of our protocols, and I would imagine many of the protocols around the world, sort of have this caveat for extubation, at least um, protocolized extubation, to exclude folks who are either in shock or in shock of a certain severity. And so we were particularly interested in whether or not this was reasonable, because we imagine this delays extubation for certain folks. We thought there may be less physiologic reserve, and it may just be a marker of ongoing acute illness, right, that we just don't have another way to, to quantify. And so we thought there might be difference. This actually was prompted our work from a study um, from Dr. Kasim and, um, and their colleagues um, out of a single uh, ICU in the UK. And they basically looked at about 1,700 patients and said, are of people who were on vasoactive agents, including dobutamine, so including inotropes, during mechanical ventilation. And they said, are you more likely to have poor outcomes if you're extubated still on your vasoactive agents versus not? And as you can see here, they found no difference in reintubation, no difference in ICU mortality, and no difference in hospital mortality. That's their Kaplan-Meier curves. But we wondered whether or not, first of all, would the study be generalizable? It was a single ICU. But also, they seemed to be missing a couple of things just because they didn't have access to them that maybe we could improve upon. And so the first was, we didn't have any idea, that's that black box over there, of how sick people were at the time of extubation. That study had a really nice ability to adjust for Ill illness severity on presentation to the ICU but not at the time of extubation. And then similarly, we felt like they mixed in all comers when it came to shock. And that might be something different between people with low-level shock, however you chose to define that, versus high-level shock. And so this is the work that uh, Dr. Zarabian, who is a resident in our group, uh, did that, that Dr. Zhang nicely uh, alluded to, and we appreciate that. Um, so we looked again, this is uh, patients in four different Calgary ICUs. They included medical, surgical, and mixed med surge ICUs. They do have separate cardiac surgery ICUs, and they were not part of this population. Um, and as you can see here, we chose to use reintubation at 96 hours, because that was actually what our uh, uh, Alberta and colleagues felt was appropriate for their data set. So you can see even within us, no consistency. Um, and what I'm going to show you here is both divided, the blue will be low, the, the red will be high. Um, these are hazard ratios after adjustment for patient factors. So reintubation and hospital mortality, if the hazard ratio is greater than one, that means the risk is higher. But for ICU length of stay and hospital length of stay, because what you're looking for is a hazard of leaving the ICU, if the level is less than one, then that suggests it's a, it's a risk for you. So as you can see here, and this was the figure that was displayed before, we saw really that for high, the difference seemed to be, and, and high and low dose we defined as greater than 0.1 mics per kilo per minute of norepinephrine. Um, that was a, a fairly arbitrary decision, but is what is used in SOFA, so seemed appropriate. Um, and as you can see, it really is the high dose that seemed to have potential signal for harm. So we saw uh, greater risk of reintubation, greater risk of mortality, and, and longer lengths of stay. In the low dose group, I think most importantly, we saw no risk of reintubation. We saw reduced mortality, which I think is likely residual confounding, right? It's hard to understand how extubating somebody on vasopressors would somehow improve their likelihood of survival, but anything is possible. Um, 
But I wanted to call out that in both of these populations, and I think this is important because we're all thinking about the different things for our patients that might impact this, neither um, in the study from the UK nor in ours was there any representation from cardiac surgery patients. They had slightly different com compositions, but they really were a pretty good representation of both general mixed med surge uh, populations. So I think in summary, and, and I um, appreciate the opportunity to sort of delve into these studies with you, because I think while these are studies that I feel passionate about, um, and I think they're things we should think about, these are all retrospective studies. And so if anything, what they tell us is that the way that we're practicing now in extubating someone overnight, for instance, or in extubating someone on a vasopressor is potentially safe or unsafe in the population we're talking about. That should not mean, right, that we should go out and start extubating overnight all the people we weren't extubating before. Because unfortunately, we still don't have those prospective studies that show us that it's a causality, right, that doing this will actually help people. So I just want to make sure, because these studies have not been done, and I worry that they won't. Um, so I think in general, it's really important, as was uh, discussed in the last talk, to consider these non-traditional risk factors. But I think we have to think about our patient populations differently. And for cardiac surgery ICU patients, I think it is probably safe to continue to extubate people overnight in the manner we have been. So in the U.S. population, that means that I don't think it's a great idea for my cardiac intensivist to say, oh my God, it's five hours and 59 minutes after they came out of the OR. If I extubate them now, I meet the six-hour mark, which I have to, and I wouldn't have done it before, but they said it's safe overnight, right? Like, that's not what we mean, right? We mean for the way you guys have been doing it. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have risk uh, information on risks associated with ongoing shock, which of course is an issue in that population. For other ICU patients, I think there is potentially consideration for harm overnight for longer uh, duration mechanical ventilation patients. I work in a medical ICU. I will tell you, I extubate some folks overnight when I used to work overnight. I'm not telling you that I take this as dogma, but I think there is reason to be concerned. And so I think if you're on the fence, they, these may be the people in whom you take pause. Um, but that I do think what I can, I feel like we can take away from the, from the uh, shock study is that it is likely safe to extubate people on relatively low doses of vasopressors. But in higher, higher dose situations, again, we probably should have a bit of pause because there really may be a causal harm there that we're just not able to uncover. So that is it. Oh. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. you. You nicely shown an old rule that you should not extubate during the night. Yes. Chris. In, in bad patients, you shouldn't pull big cannulas from the patients, etc. Okay. Any questions from um, from the audience? Uh, if not, I take a privilege. Just one brief question. Please, I, I really please. like your uh, your point on a personalized approach, and that um, the other uh, for for the personal sometimes negligible factors may play a major role, like uh, alarms, noise, Certainly. too much communication, light, uh, light overnight, things like that. Could you a little bit comment on that? Yeah, I mean, from a from a. Uh, opinion perspective rather than a data perspective. Absolutely. I, I think there are many things about overnight in the ICU that we make the night much more different from the day or much more different, I should say, than people's normal night than we need to. Um, and so I think for a variety of reasons, delirium amongst them, we should work on that. And I think we have some data, right, to suggest that that's beneficial for patients for delir de delirium development. I'm not sure um, in this instance whether or not that will impact this particular question, although I do think that doing stuff overnight that creates noise in the ICU um, is probably not great for the other patients in the right. ICU. Maybe that's what you were yeah, alluding yeah, exactly. to. Um, okay, one more question. Does it work? Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you see any practical benefit in extubating a patient 10 p.m. compared to waiting overnight for me it's just uh, not there actually when it comes to stuffing i think most of us understand what i mean thank you I, I, my guess is I, I do understand what you mean as well my guess is that it depends a bit on where one practices so i will tell you I, i'm now in miami but i was in new york before um we would frequently have people uh sitting in our icu for longer than they needed to be because occupancy was quite high and occupancy was quite high on the floor and so new people needing to get in were not able to get in and so I do think if you're talking about caring for the population as a whole that we have to take care of, expediting throughput can have its own advantages. I don't think it should have an advantage at the expense of the patients, but yeah, I think it can have advantages. Excellent. Thank Thanks you again.
So now it's time to see how to proceed in children uh, by Dr. Randolph Adrian. Thank you. I realize that there's not probably that many pediatric people out there, but hopefully that you'll, there will be some things that are relevant um, that you can learn from um, some of the ways that we're managing things in our intensive care unit. Um, I don't have any relevant disclosures. I want to point out that a lot of the research is, comes from the Pediatric Acute Lung Injury and Sepsis Investigators Network, which is a, a network of over 90 um, pediatric ICUs in the U.S. and Canada. And this was our first trial. It was on mechanical ventilator weaning and extubation readiness testing. And, you know, weaning in general is thought to be that there's a reconditioning weakened muscles and allowing the lungs to continue healing, where extubation readiness is really a lot of the things that we've learned in children is most of them don't necessarily need all that reconditioning and they can actually pass a lot of these patients as soon as they start recovering with the extubation readiness and trying to figure out with a spontaneous breathing trial which ones need further support and which ones might be close to extubation is uh, very important. So we developed this, these guidelines that were basically based on Wes Ely's extubation readiness test and um, we had uh, some rules in this study that we did that was published in JAMA and then we would drop the oxygen and drop the PEEP and um, first evaluate oxygenation and if the patient failed from oxygenation we would abort and then um, we would then look at their, ex their um, uh, ventilation and their work of breathing and especially in children how tachypnic they are and in infants they could be breathing at 60. So if they were breathing under 40 for example that could be acceptable for an infant but for a, a teenager it would be more adult levels. So we would monitor them for two hours and we had these tachypneics exceeding this limit based on age as to whether they failed. And so one thing that we learned we also before this, we had randomized them into one of three arms for weaning, pressure support, volume support. Volume support was an automated mode on the Siemens ventilator that adjusted the tidal volume, the pressure support to achieve a tidal volume, and then no protocol arm. And what we found in the weaning part of it was no difference because the amount of time in these weaning protocols was so short like two days, it wasn't really, it was hard to say that a few hours were going to really make a difference because children tend to recover very quickly. Most of these children had pneumonia. But 42% of these patients passed the extubation readiness test and didn't even go into the weaning protocol. And 84 of those ones were extubated success successfully. So one of the first lessons learned was a lot of these kids, after they recover from their severe pneumonia, can pretty much be tested and they recover very fast compared to elderly patients. Um, so we had, you know, we looked at the different types of uh, weaning and um, we really didn't see much difference. Actually, the meeting, median um, weaning times you can see are under um, two days, which is really too short to really see a difference. But the other thing we found was sedation was really, really impacting weaning. And kids don't like to be on the ventilator with a tube in their throat. And when they don't want to do something, you have to give them pretty heavy sedation to convince them to lay there and tolerate the ventilator. So, you know, the amount of sedation we use in children is often really high because there's not, they're, they're less likely to be cooperative with the process of, of being on the ventilator. And once they're awake, They'll either take the tube out themselves if you don't um, take it out yourself or, or sedate them. So we look, we found a lot of uh, factors in that study as well as in for further studies. These are similar probably to um, things in adults except for there's a lot of congenital conditions, especially with upper airway anomalies in children that predispose them to uh, failure and younger age because infants have different um, they don't have a hard rib cage, they don't have the muscle strength, they have lower FRC, they're prone to fail um, more than, um, and the younger they are, the more prone they are to fail. 
But, you know, um, a lot of our cases, of it, because the infant's airway is the size of their pinky, and so, you know, they're very, around the cricoid area, they get very swollen, and it, they can have very, very significant airway resistance. And so one thing that we studied um, was steroids for upper airway obstruction, which was one of the common causes of failing. Um, and there was multiple trials of that, in, and in general, the meta-analysis were showing that these were beneficial. But one thing to note, only about 32% of the patients in these trials of weaning and extubation are actually, um, you know, screened patients actually end up in the study. So most of these patients are excluded. So we don't know much about weaning and extubation in those patient populations for multiple reasons. And um, a lot of them, cyanotic congenital heart disease, those are, they need to be in different studies because of the effect on their heart and that baseline, they're cyanotic. And so a lot of these parameters can't be watched. And then these ones with the upper airway obstruction, um, we have to do different things to evaluate the upper airway obstruction to see that it's resolved enough before you can extubate them. So, you know, factors, it, and there's a lot of factors that influence extubation readiness. Um, and, you know, you have to make sure that all of the patients have really um, been optimized and using sedation protocols can help with that. And, it, but really the data um, back in 2009, when they did a systematic review, they also found that really there wasn't any real, um, method that could be recommended over any other method except um, recommended to potentially do spontaneous breathing trials and still finding that upper airway obstruct obstruction was the um, was one of the main causes. Now we usually did our spontaneous breathing trials with pressure support adjusted for the level of the, in the size of the endotracheal tube. So if someone has a size four or less, we would put, use 10 if you had a size, um, you know, or actually a size three, less than four, we'd use 10 of pressure support, a size four, eight, and then higher than that, you would use six. There wasn't really any science around it, but we had to start somewhere and the resistance really goes up with the size of the tube, the internal diameter. But we then found like you just looking at the actual population of patients that in a lot of these patients, we could be overestimating with pressure support. And this has been shown with adults too. Um, whether um, their readiness for extubation. So, and with, and so then Roby Kamani, um, who's at um, Children's LA, also did a lot of physiologic testing in these populations and also showed that pediatric extubation readiness tests in many patients maybe shouldn't use pressure support. And, you know, he's done a lot of work on respiratory muscle strength. A lot of that is, is consistent with the, what they found in adults. And looking at, um, and he's also now um, done a lot of physiolo physiology-based tools to evaluate the upper airway obstruction. And so, you know, really um, this study here with a thousand children looking at the, act, you know, um, incorporating some of this and looking at that accuracy of extubation readiness test, 43% passed the extubation readiness test. This was done over, you know, um, 15 years after the first trial, pretty much the same thing. A lot of them were extubated successfully, um, but the problem is a lot of them weren't extubated. So they passed the test, but they're not extubated. Maybe it's nighttime, and then the problem with that is you have to give them sedation all night, and then by the time you ratchet it down, they won't just wake up um, right away. We can't use propofol in kids due to propofol infusion syndrome for long periods of time. So, um, you know, we're using narcotics and benzodiazepines and dexmedetomidine. So anyways, this was the first European, um, it was the Pediatric Me Mechanical Ventilation Consensus Conference. Um, it was actually international, but it also, um, it was published in Intensive Care Medicine. And, you know, what they said about weaning, they really said there's insufficient data for everything for recommending the timing and initiation, the approach. There's no data to support superiority of an approach, no data to recommend how to do the extubation readiness tests, which, so they had some expert, you know, good clinical practice recommendations. But then the next trial that came out was this um, sandwich study, 
in JAMA. It was from the UK Pediatric Network. And what they did is they, um, they did eight, had 18 pediatric ICUs in the UK. They randomized them in a cluster randomization to protolyze care intervention that had sedation and ventilator liberation, knowing that the two of them interact very tightly in children versus usual care. And although it was technically a positive study, there was decreased um, hours by two, well, actually less than two with a protocolized intervention. What is two hours? So is that clinically important? That's the question. And believe it or not, the ones in the protocol or the intervention had a longer stay in the hospital, statistically significant. So what is the clinically important outcome here? Why are you getting them, you know? So anyways, that ended up being, unfortunately, uh, it was a wonderful trial, but, um, you know, unfortunately it didn't give us a clear answer. And so this was the latest. It was a policy network document, um, international though, with a lot of different people um, weighing in. Um, published in the Blue Journal, and um, you can't really see this, but um, this is evaluating for extubation, doing a safety screen, and then looking at cardiopulmonary, and then they have this group at higher risk of extubation failure, looks very similar to what I showed you before, who um, might need to go on non-invasive support, so extubate them to a higher level of support since they're at more... Um, chance of failure. But what do we do in clinical practice at my institution? Well, in the absence of evidence, one thing you can do is just an iterative quality improvement initiative to see what's going on, how you can make it better, and, do, and, and optimize it in your own institution and figure out what are the barriers. So we do this whole exhibition readiness assessment. The, the RTs do that, and um, every morning, they figure out first, are they extubate, are they eligible? And then they do it starting at, at like six in the morning. They, um, if they're not eligible, we have alternative pathways for the patient um, to potentially do a modified extubation readiness test at higher levels of support, knowing that you're probably gonna extubate them to non-invasive support. Um, and then we ensure that they have consistent respiratory effort we titrate the sedation. If they pass it, we huddle. they huddle with the team. We pre-round at 7 a.m. And then the goal is to try to get them excavated within four hours. Now that's hard because we round at that time, but they do the excavation readiness test. We have this data for rounds so that we know that there's these patients might be eligible for excavation. If they fail, we try to see why did they fail? Were they over sedated? Turn it down. Try again the extubation readiness test in the afternoon or once they wake up. And then we huddle. They huddle with the team. We fill out this extubation checklist to make sure that everything's okay for extubation. And then the goal had been to try to get all these patients extubated pretty quickly. Um, and so we had over 1,300 patients that we have more now, but we've made some other interventions. And, um, you know, a lot of the patients were ineligible for this, um, but some patients don't even need to be tested. They can just be extubated because they really underwent a surgical procedure. They don't have lung disease. Um, and so they're out of these, 70% of our ventilator admits were tested, and some of them did, didn't have a good respiratory drive and sedation was a reason, so we implemented a sedation protocol. Um, but we then decided to look at delays. Why weren't they excavated in four hours when they passed it? So a very few of them were the blue, failed and weren't retested. This red is they were delayed. Green, they, they were extubated. And this is the months um, in, from 2015 to 17. So we tried to look at these root, these delays. Why were they delayed? So some of these delays in the purple were because the patient was a little bit too unstable. Delay because we had to do an MRI or take them to do a procedure. But most of them were delays for other reasons. These red right here and then sedation. So we the sedation protocol hopefully, you know, that we implemented with that we're trying to see if we can get that down to minimal. Most of these reasons were the physician wasn't available because we had this rule that a physician had to be at the bedside when you extubate the patient. 
we were on rounds. The fellow was off doing a, a CT or MRI scan. You know, the, then we would say delay, delay, sedate, sedate, while we delay until the afternoon. So what we implemented was this RNRT extubation protocol where we have the RN, first you evaluate the patient, you, um, you know, turn down the sedation. Um, sometimes we'll put them on temporary propofol that we can wash out the sedation and then turn it off, let them wake up. And then we have the RNRT, we're there, we're not at the bedside, we're rounding, so we're right nearby. We have everything in case there's a problem. And we've assessed them to be very low risk. So now 22% of our extubations are done this way, and we haven't had any major problems. And um, you can't be off the floor, you have to be you know, nearby there. And we haven't had any problems, and now we have much fewer reasons for delaying extubation when they pass the test because somebody's not available to stand at the bedside to extubate them. So anyways, um, just in summary, you know, um, you know, a lot of our patients aren't in these studies. Um, there's no real optimal evidence-based approach, but you can do a learning healthcare system, real-world world approach, and still learn things and change things and optimize your care and your population, um, which is what we did. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We have a time for one question. We're a little over time. Yes, please. Hello, and thank you. Do you prescribe um, regular corticosteroids by your extubation? Not prophylactic. Yeah, not prophylactic regularly. So we test a leak, and um, if they have a leak that's, um, you know, that if they have no leak or they have a leak that's like above 25, um, we basically then do give them Decadron. But not routinely to all of them. We try to prevent exposure to corticosteroids. Thank you very much. So uh, it's time for uh, moving further. Uh, extubation failure in neurological patients, and uh, I kind of ask Kara Roba. Hello. Actually, the, uh, the, the title in the, in the program was a bit uh, um, corrected, and that was the title that was given to me. So extubation failure, but especially the need and the timing of tracheostomy, which uh, in uh, uh, neurological patients is a very hot topic nowadays, and uh, we are discussing a lot about uh, this, and I would like to discuss it with you. So uh, this is my conflict of interest, which has uh, nothing to do with this uh, talk, and this is sort of the agenda and objectives of this uh, chat. So I will uh, demonstrate to you that, uh, as always, especially when it's about uh, mechanical ventilation, neurological patients behave very different from uh, the general ICU population. We always try to extrapolate the guidelines from the general ICU population and put them in neurocritical care, but they never work. So yeah, we need to, to provide uh, specific evidence for this uh, population. And then we, we will discuss together about the need and indication for tracheostomy, not not just after the extubation failure, but you know, in neurological patients, uh, you will see that there are a lot of issues related to the prognosis of these uh, patients and the timing of the tracheostomy, which is uh, still a burning point. So, as I was mentioning before, uh, I think that uh, in this session we have understood that there are some criteria for uh, winning and uh, for extubation failure and uh, extubation success. Well, uh, in brain injured patients, these conventional winning parameters, which include also factors like respiratory rate, uh, the tidal volume, um, the, the inspiratory force, the PEF itself, have a role, but despite this, they cannot explain all the extubation failure. Actually, they can explain only a very small part of extubation failure in this population. And the reason is uh, exactly what I was mentioning before. We have neurological patients. These are patients with a brain injury. So all what concerns the motility, the ability to cough, to protect the airway, depends obviously from uh, the acute brain injury. And uh, a lot of research has focused on the role of a GCS, the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is uh, the most important important scale, most useful, uh, used scale that is applied uh, in uh, neurological critically ill patients. 
And this is a very nice study of uh, some years ago, which basically demonstrated that uh, simple motor tasks, so just asking the patient whether he can obey commands, can you squeeze my hand, can you stick my tongue out, can you stick your tongue out, please? Um, these are independently predict of extubation failure or not. Uh, so the best motor response with uh, a motor score of six, which becomes a total GCS at least of eight, because, because there is the eyes response and the verbal response, and tongue protrusion of, te uh, of test negative. Now, from these and other studies, you probably know that um, there is the magic number that has been proposed about the GCS, which is the eight. So everybody thinks that uh, if the GCS is below eight, uh, the patient can't be extubated. If it is above uh, eight, uh, the patient can be extubated. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not that easy because there is not a magic number like for everything. This is a very large, interesting study from uh, the Canadian group of uh, Victoria McCready. And uh, here, basically, um, the factors that were associated with the risk of uh, extubation failure were the age, the sex, the presence of the reflexes, the fluid balance, which again is something to be taken in consideration, especially in this population, but not the GCS not the motor score, not any neurological factors which were associated initially. So there was a bit of, uh, of confusion because if the magic number doesn't work anymore, uh, what is going to work? And that's why it was planned a few years ago uh, with a group of a neurointensive care of, uh, of uh, ESICM, uh, the ENIO study. This is a, a very large observational study which was performed by the group of Raphael Cinotti, so the group of, uh, of our French colleagues, and which involved uh, many, many centers. And it was the first observational study which specifically focused on, uh, on neurological patients and on extubation. 1,500 patients, if you see, uh, 230 of them were uh, extubated within uh, day five. So only a minority of these were able to be extubated quite early. And a large number, we will discuss it later, needed a tracheostomy or as primary tracheostomy or as extubation failure. But uh, in this study, uh, what Chinotti and colleague did uh, was uh, to understand which are the reasons for extubation failure in these patients. And as I was mentioning, in the majority of the cases, the extubation failure was related to neurological factors. Neurological factors, but not with a specific GCS, at least in the initial observational uh, part of this, uh, of this paper. Airway impairment and respiratory failure was present only in uh, the 16 of the percent of the cases of patients who failed the extubation, and fascial trauma only in in, uh, in the four percent, so quite different from the uh, from the other populations, and uh, the total extubation failure in this population was nearly twenty percent. I think it's quite tight, and it means that we probably need to provide uh, more evidence to help the clinician in understanding when it is the right moment and the right way to do it. Large variability across different countries was found. If you see, there are countries like France who had extubation failure of uh, up to 44% of the cases. Um, and in other, in other centers, it was uh, nearly zero. So probably it depends by the presence of internal protocol and practice. It depends on the type of brain injury. Intracranial hemorrhage patients have a higher risk of extubation failure. And then higher age, the presence of comorbidities, low GCS, but we don't know which is the magic number, ICP monitoring and tier three therapies, which means that the worst was the clinical presentation of these patients and the higher was the need of monitoring, treating the intracranial hypertension, and the higher was the risk of uh, uh, extubation failure. And what uh, Raphael did, which I think was a very good idea, was to try to create exactly, as I told you before, an instrument for the clinicians to help them to, get, to have some tools to predict, to be able to pred predict whether my patients will probably fail the intubation. And the uh, predictors of extubation success with this uh, system with ha which has uh, an acceptable, I would say, area under the curve, 0.71, 61% of sensitivity, which is not great, at 0 to, uh, 81 of specificity. And seven main predictors were observed. The presence of TBI is related to 
higher possibility of uh, uh, extubation success, the presence of cough, gag reflex, the need of endotracheal suction below two times a hour, body temperature, and the GCS above six. So again, here basically they found that what they what they did in this paper were to assess the different levels of GCS, and according to these results, the, G, the new magic number is uh, is around uh, six. And this is a meta-analysis which was published uh, just one month uh, after the ENIO study, so it did not take in consideration the ENIO study. I think we should uh, remake this analysis with, uh, with a new data. But unfortunately, here again, the GCS putting together all the previous studies came negative, uh, considering a, also a motor score below five. So patient who does not obey and patient who does not localize to, to the pain stimulus. What do the guidelines say? So a couple of years ago, uh, we sat down with, uh, with a panel of the European Society of Intensive Care, and we tried to, to, to put down some guidelines. And when it was the moment of uh, talking about uh, weaning and uh, extubation failure, we started, as always, to do a systematic review and the grading. Now look here on your right, the results of a systematic review and of the grading. No evidence for everything. It's true that uh, all the wonderful and very good papers that have been performed uh, in the general ICU population many times have uh, as exclusion criteria the presence of, uh, of a brain injury because there are some pathophysiological concerns. So we really had to rely on, uh, on um, common sense and on what the small papers and few papers that we had uh, available uh, will say. And here what we said is that uh, we have to be careful in brain injured patients because uh, of course uh, we recommend that uh, if a patient, uh, the decision to extubate and we in a patient with brain injury needs to take in consideration the level of consciousness, the gag reflex, the ability to protect the airways. But at the end, we have to be fair because we are unable to provide a recommendation recommendation regarding the specific GCS. To us, there is not a magic number. So please keep this in mind because uh, the eight of GCS has been always a, a typical question of, a, of the examination of a medical student, but it's not like this. A patient with a GCS of nine can fail the extubation and the patient with seven of GCS can, uh, can be successful. So these are patients who very frequently need the tracheostomy. And I have to say that even in this case, um, in the general ICU population, the guidelines and uh, the indications are much more clear. Um, tracheostomy, this is one of the many famous studies regarding the, the need of tracheostomy in the general ICU population. And there is a common recommendation according to which prolonged ventilation, so above uh, 14 days, uh, requires tracheostomy and that after seven days we have to consider tracheostomy. In brain injured patients, this is uh, a bit different because again, what you have to think about is the neurological trajectories. And I can tell you that it's not so easy after five, seven days to make an appropriate uh, prognosis from a neurological point of view. So it's quite difficult to understand where the patient is going, especially in the, in the early phases. This is a paper that uh, we wrote with a group from uh, Spain. A lot of uh, patients, more than 4,000 retrospective study. And basically what we did was to analyze the, percent, the need of tracheostomy over time. Three cohort of uh, patients, 2004, 2010, 2016. Now we are completing a large observational study, which is the VentiBrain study. So we will have uh, soon here the results of 2022. If you see the need for tracheostomy is high, but didn't change much uh, from 2004 and 2016. Other parameters regarding ventilation in brain injured patients have importantly changed in the last 20 years, but probably not the need of tracheostomy. And uh, even the time from intubation, the median time in 2004 was 12. Now things are slightly changed three days before, but median time of nine days in, uh, in this population. What does the study uh, says about this? 
20%, 21% of patients require the tracheostomy, so even higher than in 2004 and in 2010, and the median time which is comparable with, uh, with those of, uh, of 2016. And which are the factors, the predictors of uh, tracheostomy? Mm, a few years ago, we have uh, performed with this sub-analysis of a center TBI study which, uh, where we considered here only TBI patients because then brain injuries are different one to each other. And we found as predictor the age, the presence of thoracic trauma, not of facial trauma, and the poor neurological status requiring invasive ICP as predictors for need of a tracheostomy. Again, when we put down the, uh, the guidelines for, of, uh, for the ESICM, we, we haven't been so precise because we didn't have any evidence. And uh, basically, we gave a general advice if a patient failed to extubation, go for a tracheostomy. But especially if a patient has persistent reduced level of evidence, go for an early tracheostomy. And here is, uh, is the problem because here it's about deciding when doing a tracheostomy in these patients. Uh, which are the issues of doing an early or a late tracheostomy? This is a survey that we did some years ago, asking which are the main complications that you see when you do a tracheostomy. As early complications, uh, bleeding controlled by local pressure, these are not major complications, I have to say. And the same is for middle-term complications. We know that tracheostomy is becoming quite uh, a safe technique. But what scares uh, a bit more or the the responders and the physician probably are the high rate of functional abnormalities after tracheostomy. If you see after six months, the 51% of the patients have difficulties in speech. It's something that we have to take in consideration. When we decide about early, which can potentially uh, help in a better winning, in a less need of sedative, in the prevention of uh, pneumonia, and on the other side, on the avoidance of uh, a possible unnecessary tracheostomy. Uh, we are unable to provide any recommendation regarding the optimal timing of tracheostomy. And uh, basically, this recommendation came from the fact that in the PICO question, in terms of outcome, uh, we put the mortality and the neurological outcome. And I'm going to show you the evidence of this. This is, in fact, uh, uh, the survey which was done by the group of a set point trial who basically asked before starting the randomized control trial the median time, but especially asked, uh, could you tell with uh, reasonable uh, certainty after five days if a patient will require a tracheostomy? So are you able to make a prognosis in these patients after four days? always in 3% of the cases. It's pure reality. They are absolutely right, and, uh, and I totally agree. These are the results from a certain TBI study, so only TBI patients. There is huge heterogeneity. You see there are centers uh, who do only do early tracheostomy. The majority do late tracheostomy, but with uh, an important difference according to the concept of late tracheostomy. And here in the center TBI study, we didn't find any difference in terms of characteristic of the patients uh, according to those who had early or late tracheostomy, except obviously the complications in the, in the ICU. Now, as I mentioned, we always look for, uh, for the outcomes. And we always look for mortality and neurological outcomes because they are the major outcomes. For, this, for the timing of tracheostomy, we never found an effect on neurological outcome and mortality, and that's the main uh, issue. Uh, this is, uh, again, the study on uh, uh, TBI patients. Mm, here it was the only study where there was a signal on better neurological outcome, but not on mortality. This is a meta-analysis. Uh, this is a part only on TBI patients, uh, and we found early reduced duration of mechanical ventilation and reduced length of stay, but no difference in mortality. This is another study which basically demonstrated an improvement in resource optimization for early tracheostomy, but no effect on mortality on neurological outcome. And this is the group of the stroke, because as mentioned, brain injury patients are much more different one to each other, and stroke patients are those who have a higher risk of dysphagia or uh, inability to protect their airway. And in fact, the majority of the studies are on stroke. This is the meta-analysis, but even in stroke, 
no difference in mortality, only in length of stay. And on, in the stroke population, here we have the only two randomized control trial. This is the first safety and uh, feasibility study, which was positive. It, the, the early tracheostomy demonstrated to be feasible and safe. But when uh, the set point group did uh, the study, which was uh, powered on the outcome of mortality and neurological outcome, it came negative. So, uh, I have uh, done. This is just the last uh, slide to, to discuss and to, let, to show you that uh, the quality of life after tracheostomy in neurological patients is very poor. And we have to keep in mind that there is not just the patient, but also the caregivers. And this is a survey which basically reported high level of depression and low quality of life, even in the caregiver of this patient. So when we decide when to go for a tracheostomy, these are all factors that need to take, be taken in, uh, in consideration because tracheostomy is more than timing, is uh, a thinking about the future of the patient. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sorry, just one burning question. Yeah. Yes? So, um, in patients who are intubated, we generally calculate the V as a T, which means one. So, in fact, what uh, uh, was shown in, in the initial, the second slide, is that basically what you should look more in this patient is the motor score because it's the one that is more easy to be assessed in patients who are intubated. Even the eyes response, but it depends also on, uh, on different factors. The motor scores is definitely the part of a GCS that uh, can help you more. Okay, thank you very much. And our last talk will be given by Gavin Perkins. Welcome, the stage is yours. So thank you very much. So in the final 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to focus on non-invasive ventilation to support the weaning process. My name is Gavin Perkins. I'm a critical care physician from the West Midlands in the UK. Uh, these are my conflicts of interest. I'm not going to dwell on them as they're not particularly relevant uh, in the context of this talk. So this is just going to be a very quick uh, refresh of the uh, European uh, Respiratory Society uh, pathway for weaning because it provides a useful conceptual framework upon which I'll base uh, the bulk of the talk. It starts from uh, the early identification and treatment of acute respiratory failure to suspecting that the patient's ready for weaning. Uh, daily and more frequently assessing for readiness, considering uh, spontaneous breathing trials once or twice a day once the person is considered ready for weaning. A proportion of patients will fail the spontaneous breathing trial and go back through the pathway, but the majority will proceed to successful extubation, uh, of which a small proportion will require reintubation, and then they'll go back through the weaning pathway. So um, if you can bear that conceptual framework in mind, particularly the second part of the uh, talk will draw upon it. So non-invasive ventilation, again, in the interest of time, I'm not going to dwell on the benefits of it as a tool, but physiologically, uh, it helps improve the work of breathing. Uh, it reduces the risk potentially of barotrauma, airway damage, ventilator-associated infections. Patients require less or no sedatives, uh, and then there's a specific evidence base to support its use in patients with COPD and left ventricular failure. So if you want to take a bird's eye view at the uh, evidence informing the use of non-invasive ventilation to facilitate weaning, then this Cochrane review published in Thorax provides that bird's eye view by really pooling all of the evidence from 28 different studies together into a single place uh, and saying, if you take the technology of non-invasive ventilation, how effective is it for improving outcomes? And I think uh, when we come to the next few slides, it will be impressive, uh, really, the uh, amount of research that has been uh, taking place of randomised controlled trials in this setting. 
So to think about the study characteristics, they're broadly patients that have been ventilated for more than 48 hours. And as you'll see through the slides, there are two predominant groups, uh, those where there's a predominance of COPD and those that have either mixed uh, or a predominantly hypoxic cause of respiratory failure. There's significant heterogeneity in both geography, but also the inclusion criteria for the studies, with some uh, looking at the fulfillment of specific weaning criteria and then progressing to non-invasive ventilation. Others using the technology after a spontaneous breathing trial has failed and extubating and using that to support the patient, whilst others will do it to prevent reintubation in patients that have passed a spontaneous breathing trial. And then there's uh, some uh, Chinese studies that use a pulmonary infection window. The interventions are also heterogeneous. There's a variety of non-invasive ventilation modes and a variety of different interfaces that have been pulled together. So the studies really do provide very much a bird eye view. There's probably two things to draw from this study, which is the, the, the summary of evidence. Uh, broken down into two populations. In the top half of the slide, it's patients where the population, the majority, had uh, COPD. And the bottom is more of a mixed cohort where certainly uh, there were less than 50% of patients that were included that had COPD as the underlying diagnosis. On the top of the slide, there's clear evidence of a mortality benefit for the year early use of non-invasive ventilation in patients that have COPD. That's slightly less certain, although the point estimate is still in the direction of a mortality benefit in the broader mixed group of respiratory failures shown at the bottom. Ventilator-associated pneumonia are consistent <coughs> benefits for both uh, those with predominantly COPD and also the mixed etiology. And if one then looks at the host of other outcomes included in that review that fairly consistently uh, across the other outcomes, and this is now for the combination of the two populations, positive benefits in terms of weaning uh, success, reduction in intensive care and hospital length of stay, uh, spending less time weaning and less time requiring invasive ventilation, and a reduction in the proportion of patients proceeding on to tracheostomy. So taking that totality of evidence, uh, supportive of the use of non-invasive ventilation as a tool to aid weaning. This study is useful because it shines a light on that population, the bottom part of the, the, the previous slides, which are the population of patients with mixed respiratory failure who have primarily a hypoxic cause rather than a hypercapnic cause of respiratory failure. So this individual patient meta-analysis uh, pulled out patients that were hypoxic across six studies, uh, pooling together just uh, over 450 patients. One can see in the cohort in the Cochrane review where there was uncertainty pooling together that individual participant uh, data showing significant effects uh, across the majority of outcomes. So reduced duration of invasive ventilation, a reduced duration of total ventilation time, reduction in ventilator associated pneumonia uh, and a reduction in time to hospital discharge with the only outcome not showing a significant benefit but the point estimate in the right direction being tied to ITU death. I'm now going to focus on uh, the, the previous Cochrane review looked at non-invasive technology as a whole. Uh, this uh, network meta-analysis and systematic review published recently in Intensive Care Medicine by Shannon Fernando uh, and colleagues looks at the effect of uh, the different modalities. Uh, again, this is a pooled population of studies. It included studies with both preventative uh, and rescue therapy. One can see in the bottom side of the, the chart that compared to conventional oxygen therapy, either non-invasive ventilation or high flow nasal cannulas uh, being superior to conventional uh, oxygenation for more, um, sorry, no effect for mortality across the, uh, the group of outcomes there. But if one moves to reintubation, a positive effect for both non-invasive ventilation and high flow nasal oxygenation. It's interesting that when the network goes on to compare between treatments, it doesn't find evidence that either high flow or non-invasive ventilation is superior uh, one compared to the other. I will return to this study as I move through the, um, uh, come to the final part of the, uh, the, the talk. 
What one thing this um, study also highlights is the cohort of patients most likely to uh, benefit from the intervention. So those considered at high risk of reintubation are those most likely to benefit from non-invasive ventilation as part of their weaning strategy. So this is the bit that we're going to just look at the, um, the three different, uh, I guess, areas uh, where one might apply in practice. The first is as part of the weaning process. So this is a group of patients that fail the spontaneous breathing trial and they're extubated uh, in order to then receive non-invasive ventilation. And I'll, I'll touch on that before looking at its use as post-extubation preemptive treatment and then rescue therapy. So the BREATHE study that was a UK-based study randomised around about 500 uh, patients to, uh, who had failed a spontaneous breathing trial to either extubation and immediate application of non-invasive ventilation or to continuing conventional weaning uh, with repeating uh, daily assessments of spontaneous breathing trials and then uh, extubating the patient when they pass the spontaneous breathing trial. Uh, criteria for spontaneous breathing trial failure were drawn from the ERS uh, guidelines and comprise physiological uh, blood gas and clinical assessments. I'm not going to go through the algorithm in detail other than to note that the two algorithms were fairly similar uh, in reducing the amount of pressure support based on physiological response. The main difference was the non-invasive group were receiving it through a non-invasive interface uh, and the invasive group were receiving it through a tracheal tube. So whilst the primary outcome for BREATHE was the total time to liberation from both invasive and non-invasive ventilation and the primary analysis didn't find a difference between the groups, overall in the secondary outcomes there was a reduced time of invasive ventilation, a reduction in sedation use, a reduction in the amount of time spent in intensive care. No effect on mortality and we did an economic analysis that demonstrated uh, that the treatment had a 60% chance of being cost effective. So evidence supporting uh, the use of non-invasive ventilation in patients that have failed a spontaneous breathing trial. Moving to the group that have passed a spontaneous breathing trial, they've been extubated but there's then the question, can you prevent the need for them being re-intubated by uh, initiating non-invasive ventilation? And there are two or three studies that I'll just walk you through uh, that cover this topic. The first was from Mikhail Farah and colleagues. Uh, this was a study that looked at early non-invasive ventilation to prevent extubation failure. You can see over on the left-hand side of the slide that there was a significant uh, effect found with the uh, reduction in respiratory failure in patients given non-invasive ventilation. In a post hoc, uh, or indeed, sorry, in a subgroup analysis, they also demonstrated uh, in a group with hypercapnic respiratory failure that there appeared to be a survival uh, benefit uh, from the use of uh, non-invasive ventilation after extubation. Uh, and they went on to do then a multi-centre study to address that uh, question and again demonstrated this time in patients, that cohort that they'd shown the mortality benefit of patients with hypercapnic respiratory failure. And they noted a uh, significant reduction in respiratory failure in the non-invasive group, but no significant difference in the primary analysis for mortality. But if you look at the Kaplan-Meier estimates over on the right-hand side of the uh, study that you can see, uh, it's in favor of the intervention uh, reducing mortality. So I'm just going to skip through those uh, two slides in the interest of, of time. They were other studies uh, demonstrating the use of non-invasive ventilation in different cohort of patients uh, following extubation and showing a similar uh, signal of benefit. The final area to touch on is then rescue. So this is, you've extubated a patient and you've not preemptively put them onto non-invasive ventilation, but they start to deteriorate some hours or days after extubation. And you ask yourself the question, well, do I re-intubate them or do I put them, uh, do I apply non-invasive ventilation? What one of the earliest studies to evaluate this, the study by uh, Esteban and colleagues that was a multi-centre trial in eight uh, different countries, 
adults who'd been ventilated for more than 48 hours who developed respiratory failure within 48 hours of extubation. The trial was stopped early because of a signal of harm. Uh, and that signal of harm is uh, shown here in this graph. You can see that intensive care mortality was greater in patients who had non-invasive ventilation initiated as rescue therapy. And if one looks over on the right-hand side, the authors unpick from that that they think it's likely or that the excess mortality seemed to be in the group that uh, uh, received non-invasive ventilation but went on to then uh, require invasive ventilation, suggesting that the application of non-invasive ventilation has simply denied an otherwise inevitable need for invasive ventilation and that that delay is potentially associated with harm. So I said I'd return to the uh, Fernando uh, network meta-analysis because this uh, pulled together five studies that looked at the use of rescue therapy uh, and the impact on reintubation. And what you can hopefully see uh, from the forest plot there at the bottom uh, is that the uh, point estimate for reintubation crosses one. Whilst it's in the direction of favour of non-invasive uh, ventilation, it's not demonstrating a significant effect. And then for mortality, uh, no clear evidence of benefit uh, in the rescue therapy, uh, sorry, in the rescue uh, setting. So pulling all of this together in the final 30 seconds, uh, I believe that the evidence tells us that non-invasive ventilation is an effective strategy for weaning from invasive mechanical ventilation. The benefit is most likely to be highest in patients that are at high risk of reintubation. I consider it to be useful in patients who both fail a spontaneous breathing trial as a tool to uh, liberate them from the ventilator, but to still provide them with some inspiratory support, or in patients who pass a spontaneous breathing trial and I'm extubating anyway, but I potentially consider at high risk. I would be cautious about its use as a rescue therapy if it's not planned as part of your overall plan uh, in a patient because of the risk uh, that it simply delays an otherwise necessary intubation and the harm that may arise as a consequence. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. We have the place for two questions. Any questions from the audience? So I, I will start um, concerning the um, first indication in patients failing the spontaneous breathing trial. Um, do you recommend it in all patients or do you think there are very specific uh, 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 settings uh, for, for, for that indication? So, so, so I think that the, the BREATHE trial, and I guess that's the area from recruiting patients to the trial I, I got the most uh, practice, it's the assessment of patients who are otherwise ready to, to, to wean, uh, and so they're on minimal vasopressors, treated the underlying uh, infection, and then for whatever reason they failed the, the spontaneous breathing trial that would otherwise lead to a, a, another cycle. Uh, I think in patients that still have very high oxygenation requirements, patients that are still uh, systematically unstable, that that's not the cohort of patients to simply uh, re remove the tube and extubate. So they're, they're, they're patients that were it not for the spontaneous breathing trial, you'd be comfortable to extubate. Okay, if no other questions, thank you.